Ever since the Titanic sank beneath the waves in April 1912, the same questions have been asked. Can we raise the ship? Could we recover the valuables that were left behind? Well, it wasn't until over 70 years after the sinking that the ship was even found, but almost from the first day it sank, a few dreamers set to work crafting schemes to raise the ship and recover its treasures. And these were some colourful characters too. Their ideas ranged from the unlikely and the dangerous to the downright absurd and the fanciful. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. And these are some of the true stories of possibly some of the most bizarre schemes ever devised to try and raise the Titanic. It's April 15th, 1912, at about 2.20 in the morning. Right at this moment, the stern section of the RMS Titanic is beginning to take its final plunge into the icy North Atlantic Ocean. The entire ship has been effectively ripped in two, and the bow section is already in free fall on its way to the bottom of the ocean. The ship takes its last dying breath before the sea swallows her whole. And then she's gone. Survivors looking on from lifeboats are in various stages of shock as the reality sets in. The Titanic would never see the light of day again. After the sinking, as the shock began to wear off, questions of salvage quickly began to arise from survivors and families of the victims alike. Would there be a way to retrieve the possessions? It was widely known that the ship sank with no small amount of precious cargo on board, namely an extremely rare jewel-encrusted copy of a book of poetry, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, as well as five Steinway pianos and the famous Renault CB Coupe that was locked away in the cargo hold. Would these priceless treasures truly waste away at the bottom of the ocean for all eternity? Would it not be theoretically possible to recover the ship herself and even repair her so that she could possibly be returned to sea? The wealthier families among those caught up in the sinking, namely the Guggenheims, Astors and Wideners, were seeking answers to these questions. So they formed a consortium and directed a proposal to the Merritt and Chapman Derrick and Wrecking Company. Wow, that name really rolls off the tongue, we'll just call them Merritt. The wreck would be raised from the ocean floor in order to retrieve lost possessions, as well as return the bodies of the victims to their families. It was still 1912 though, and technology was just very far off from being able to simply retrieve the world's largest ocean liner from the seabed. In fact, it probably wouldn't even be possible today. Merritt and Chapman looked over the proposal, but ultimately had to reject it. The plan was just far beyond what anyone was capable of at the time. Now that would be the sensible thing to do, but not everybody would have that kind of common sense. This was just the first of many proposed plans to raise Titanic from her final resting place, and some would be a little bit more outlandish than others. By 1914, two years had passed since the initial bid to raise the wreck, and already a brand new scheme was at work. This time, it was crafted by a Denver architect named Charles Smith. Now, Smith set out not just to recover Titanic's victims and their priceless possessions, but he also hoped to, quote, once again fit the ship to sea. His plan involved, first of all, finding the wreck, a feat which in and of itself would not be achieved for another 71 years. Now, how exactly Smith hoped to find the wreck in about 2,100 fathoms, that's 12,500 feet, or just under four kilometers of ocean, is lost to history. In the latter 20th century, it took complex sonar scanning systems and underwater remote controlled vehicles. But in 1912, the closest they had to this was the diving bell, which could only reach a few hundred feet of depth, if that. Despite this, Smith's biggest issue with locating the wreck was the fact that Titanic's last given position had been incorrect by 13 miles or 21 kilometers too far to the west. It would have been a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack, except he'd be blind, and at least a minimum of 12,000 feet away from his target, and looking in the wrong haystack. Now the rest of his plan gets a bit more technical and oddly specific. Assuming he actually found the wreck somehow, Smith would, for instance, require exactly 162 men for the plan to work, no more, and no less. To put the rest plainly, Smith called for a manned submarine, powered by electricity, from cables connected to the ship above that he would design himself. The submarine would be lowered over the wreck of the Titanic by these cables, where the seven crewmen on board would direct special electromagnets towards the ship's hull. Now, in theory, they would be able to communicate with the surface from an electric telephone. The electromagnets would then be supplied with an electric current via the ship on the surface, and once the magnets adhered to Titanic's hull, additional magnets would be added, and then eventually the submarine would be pulled from the water, bringing Titanic to the surface along with it, 
and then the ship would be towed to a shallower area where it could rest on the bottom and eventually be refloated. But the simple truth is, none of that technology existed in 1914. It was an ambitious plot, but it fell more within the realms of science fiction, and of course it was never seriously actioned, although Smith apparently did draw plans for his submarine. The idea of raising the wreck of the once great Titanic was quite an alluring one to many people, and many hoped that the wreck could be converted into a museum, or put on display where it could be enjoyed for generations. Now, Some rather opportunistic folks were struck by the idea of the fame and fortune that would be waiting for them if their venture to raise the wreck was successful. As such, the ideas that sprung from these treasure hunters were, most of the time, unconventional at best. Ideas ranged from using bags filled with petroleum jelly to lift the ship, and perhaps most famously filling Titanic with ping pong balls, the buoyancy of which would raise her to the surface, never mind the fact that the ping pong balls would implode from the water pressure long before they reached the wreck. Arthur Hickey's plan was a bit different, however. In 1977, Hickey theorised that the ship could be, ironically, encased in ice by use of liquid nitrogen, kind of turned into an iceberg. The ice-enclosed ship would then simply float effortlessly to the surface with no damage to the hull. A miracle! Hickey's team, the Titanic Salvage Company, reportedly approached the British Oxygen Company, which inquired about the price of liquid nitrogen to use for this scheme. The BOC admitted that while the plan was possible, in theory, half a million tonnes of liquid nitrogen would need to be funnelled down to the wreck, requiring a floating nitrogen liquefaction plant to be built specifically and moored nearby. Now, of course, unfortunately for Hickey and his company, this plan too was deemed unfeasible. Now, while ideas like this may seem comical on their face, one man was dead serious about his plans for the ship, and his name was Douglas Forker Woolley. Woolley was born in Liverpool in 1936. He had no formal training as a sailor, engineer, or oceanographer. He didn't even really have a history background. Professionally, he dyed nylon stockings in a hosiery factory. His connection to Titanic was through his family, because as a young boy, Woolley found that two of his great aunts had actually booked passage aboard the ship, but stayed home at the last minute, claiming that they felt a bad premonition. This change of plans was too late for their checked luggage, though, which was loaded onto the ship and subsequently lost in the sinking. Now, this fact would begin Woolley's obsession with Titanic and sparked several ideas at the same time. Beginning in the 1960s, Woolley would make headlines with his varied and sundry plans to save and salvage the wreck. And one specific scheme involved locating the wreck via a bathyscaphe, a kind of submersible, and then using a multitude of nylon balloons, somehow inflated at 13,000 feet underwater, which would be attached to the ship and then slowly and gently raise the wreck out of it. However, once the team realised that it would take 10 years to generate enough gas to adequately inflate the balloons enough to raise Titanic, the plan pretty much fizzled out. Almost annually though, a new Willie-born Titanic raising scheme would pop up in the papers and some of them would even receive a fair amount of support and financial investment. One attempt in particular got as far as having near full investor backing and even a salvage vessel spoken for, but ultimately the plan unraveled, the investors never came through, and even the support boat turned out to be little more than a rusted out fishing vessel. But why were so many people still taking Woolley seriously? Well, Douglas Faulkner Woolley had plans to raise Titanic, because he claimed to own it. Woolley's logic was very simple, really. His claim to the wreck was valid, according to him, because in the late 1960s, also according to him, the British Board of Trade had given him exclusive rights to the wreck, which itself wouldn't be discovered for another 20 years. Since the Titanic had sailed under the British flag, the US had no jurisdiction, apparently, over anything having to do with the ship. Therefore, the United States Federal Court ruling, which originally granted exclusive salvage rights to another company, in 1994 was apparently null and void. For White Star Line's part, the company that owned Titanic, Woolley said once the company eventually merged with Cunard Line to form Cunard White Star, they forfeited their claims to the ship, so naturally this would leave Woolley's claim as the only valid one remaining. There's also a letter from the British Board of Trade involved. It all makes quite a lot of sense and people totally understand it, since the wreck of Titanic belongs apparently to Douglas Faulkner Woolley by rights, he is therefore to do exactly as he pleases with it, including raising it from the seafloor, turning it into a museum, and even installing a chapel inside the wreck. So those who opposed Woolley's plans on the grounds that Titanic is essentially a gravesite, well, Woolley shot back by pointing out that a gravesite is no longer a gravesite after 75 years, which is of course a widely known fact that is accepted by scientists and historians everywhere. Now, you probably noticed that Douglas Woolley is a bit of a colourful character. He also claimed to have exclusive salvage rights and ownership of the RMS Queen Elizabeth, which burnt and sank in Hong Kong Harbour. 
He had plans to restore her, much like the Titanic. That's a story for another day. In the end, the Queen Elizabeth was scrapped in situ, and then the rest of her was covered and encased in concrete that forms part of Hong Kong's harbour today. Willie's repeated attempts to legally contest the salvage rights granted to that other company would of course prove fruitless, and to this day they remain the sole entity with exclusive salvage rights to the wreck of the ship. So why has nobody been successful in raising Titanic even after all these years of technological advancement? Well, for one thing, the cost of the equipment, crew, and vessels required to accomplish this absolute feat would number into the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, and even with the fanfare that would come from the ship being raised, there would be no feasible way to recoup the massive costs of an expedition like this. This makes finding investors essentially a non-starter, but what's more, raising the Titanic would require unfathomable levels of engineering precision and highly specialised equipment, some of which barely even exists today. To safely hoist a brittle and decaying behemoth of a ship two miles up, and by the way, this isn't even considering the fact that it's in two halves, without causing any damage to the ship's structural integrity, it wouldn't just be a monumental undertaking, it would probably be an impossibility. Now, not even taking into account the damage that would be caused by equipment attached to the hull, experts agree that there is no feasible way, in any way, shape or form, to move the ship from her final resting place without destroying what remains of her entirely. The wreck is in a severe state of decay, with sea life, bacteria and rust eating away at every inch of exposed steel. And in her current state, much of the ship would essentially crumble under even the slightest bit of strain, let alone any attempt to raise her from her final resting place. At the end of the day, most people are of the mind that Titanic is, in reality, a gravesite, and an attempt to tamper with her in this way would be tasteless and disrespectful. There's simply not enough payoff for bringing the wreck back to the surface, as far as most are concerned, and so despite the hundreds of clever schemes and promises to deliver the ship back to dry dock once again, Titanic will remain at the bottom of the Atlantic, having seen the light of day for the last time on the morning of April 15th, 1912. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.